India is the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, and the great grandmother of tradition. Our most valuable and most instructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India only, said Mark Twain. And the Punjab has played a vital role in shaping the country's history and culture. To discuss this very important subject, it's an honor to have with us noted scholar, eminent historian, and erudite professor, Sri Rajmohan Gandhi. He will be in conversation with Mr. Sunil Sethi. Rajmohan Gandhi is a biographer and the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi and a research professor at the Center for South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, University of Illinois. His previous book, A Tale of Two Revolts, India 1857 and the American Civil War, was published in 2009 in India, the UK, and the US of A. Until end of last year, he taught political science and history at the University of Illinois. Dividing his time between India and the United States, Mr. Rajmohan Gandhi has also made several visits to Pakistan. Mr. Rajmohan Gandhi, everybody. Television presenter Sunil Sethi has hosted the weekly literary show Just Books on NDTV since early 2005. He was one of the founding editorial team of India Today, has worked for the Hindustan Times, and has been a columnist for the Times of India and the Indian Express. Mr. Sunil Sethi, it's an honor to have you with us, sir. Before we get to the discussion, we are immensely honored to launch the new book by Mr. Rajmohan Gandhi, Punjab, A History from Aurangzeb to Mountbatten. I would request Mr. Sunil Sethi to please officially launch the book. For centuries, the fertile land of five rivers in the north of the Indian subcontinent was coveted by numerous empires and invaders. In this, the first major account of undivided Punjab, award-winning historian, biographer, and scholar Rajmohan Gandhi traces its history during its most tumultuous phase from the death of Aurangzeb in the early 18th century to its brutal partition in 1947, coinciding with the departure of the British. Uh, most eminently of his uh, grandfather, the great Mahatma, portraits as well as uh, one of the most discerning and personalized and astonishing political biographies and also uh, uh, equally uh, wonderful, illuminating life of his maternal grandfather, C. Rajagopalachari, the scholar, the political leader, and activist. Uh, Professor Gandhi is now, uh, in the last three years, uh, while teaching at university in the United States and traveling and working in other parts of the world, embarked on Another journey, Punjab, a history from Aurangzeb to Mount Patton. This work uh, is truly magisterial in its scope, in its detail, and the astonishing range of original research. It means personally a great deal to me as well because I'm a die-hard Punjabi. I was born in the city of Amritsar, where my family lived for 300 years, up until the 1970s. Professor, it's an astonishing work, as I said, but why Punjab, and why now? Am I being heard? Yes. Um, First of all, may I, before answering your question, may I also thank everyone for being here. I compliment you on your stamina to, to, to be here at the, at the very end of this wonderful literature festival. Uh, now, why Punjab? You know, earlier today, I'm sure many of you were here for the interview with Gulzar. And Gulzar is originally a Punjabi, as most of you would know. Uh, and he's not the only one from Punjab who has uh, played such a great role from Mumbai, from Bollywood, over the decades. Uh, so many that uh, were featured in that conversation with him. There was, of course, uh, 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 the great uh, Ra Khanna, Ra Rajesh, That's right. Rajesh Khanna, but of course the, 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 the Prithviraj Kapoor's 
uh, Nargis, Dev Anand, Segal, the great singer, um, Noor Jahan, the great singer of uh, Pakistan, and so many others in the, in the movie world have come from... Devanand, the Devanand. Holy Trinity, hardcore Punjabi from Lahore, and so many others. Uh, so Punjab's impact has been felt in so many ways. Um, but I wanted uh, the whole of India to know about Punjab, and I wanted the two Punjabs, the Indian Punjab and the Pakistani Punjab, to know each other. Uh, a friend of mine who is from Pakistan was in Amritsar the other day, and he spoke some Punjabi, and a young, bright Sikh said to him, Tu sibi Punjabi bolte ho? You also speak Punjabi? And the truth is that a great many young people today in Indian Punjab don't know that there are 90 million Punjabi speakers in Pakistani Punjab. 90 million. Uh, 90 million is population larger than Egypt, larger than Turkey, larger than Iran. But uh, so many in our Punjab and in much of India have forgotten that the Pakistani Punjabis also speak Punjabi. And likewise in Pakistani Punjab, they have completely forgotten, many of them, that so many Hindus and Sikhs lived in Lahore, in Rawalpindi, in Multan, in Sargoda, in Lyalpur. Uh, and that so many Muslims lived in Amritsar, Jalandhar, Ludhiana and so forth. So apart from informing all of India about Punjab, I also wanted the two Punjabs to be connected with each other. And there were other reasons. Now, um, yeah, so I'll stop, stop with that one. What is uh, both dramatic and tragic about the history of Punjab is that it is also the history of one of the great wounds in the subcontinent of the 20th century, the partition. Only two parts of India, Bengal and Punjab, were rent asunder. And those scars have successively uh, haunted and traumatized generations. Uh, was that since you grew up in Delhi, you went to school there in 1947, a very brutal moment of Indian history. Was that the trigger? There's no doubt that the 1947 trauma was, played a very large part in my life. Uh, as I was growing up in Delhi, I went to school there. Uh, in my school, we had very few Punjabi boys before 47. We had some Muslim boys who from one day to the next vanished. And then Sikh boys and Hindu Punjabi boys from Lahore and elsewhere in uh, West Punjab came suddenly to the school. Our school also found a new Punjabi principal. Punjabi teachers came. Um, that was a very noticeable change in my world at that time when I was 11 or 12 years old. Um, and then as I learned more about the killings of uh, 47, uh, at that time and throughout my life, the killings of 1947 in Punjab have remained a very important part of my life. And so that certainly played a, a, a part, a, a powerful part in my wanting to write this story. But of course, I, and I agree with you, by the way, Sunil, that uh, the partition of India was above all the partition of Bengal and the partition of Punjab. The rest of the subcontinent did not experience that trauma. Uh, Southern India remained as it was, Western India remained as it was, much of Northern India remained as it was, Bihar remained as it was, UP remained as it was, Rajasthan remained as it was. Punjab was traumatized and Bengal was traumatized. Um, I wish I had had the ability, opportunity to study and present Bengal's story. Uh, it's my great misfortune that I couldn't do that. But what a wonderful luck of mine that I'm able to engage myself with Punjab. I'm a very, very fortunate man that I spent three years with the geography, the culture, the language, the people of Punjab.
well, we are fortunate to have your history, Professor Gandhi, but uh, when I looked at the cover of this book, and here is a map of undivided Punjab, it's unrecognizable. No one can believe that before 1947, this is what northwestern India looked like. Just to give you an example, in terms of geographical area till 1947, Punjab was the largest province in India. It's uh, the writ of the governor of Punjab, based in Lahore, ran from the outskirts of Delhi all the way to Akbar's fort on the Indus River at Attic. Rahul Pindi was a Punjabi town. The northwest frontier was just a couple of hours' drive away. The only way you could go from anywhere in North India today, indeed from Delhi to Kashmir, was through Rahul Pindi. So this great land, superbly this model of administration, it had suffered before many times, but a crucible of education, higher education, if you had to study in North India, uh, you really went to Lahore. Uh, you, the courts, one of the oldest courts in the subcontinent, were in Lahore. Uh, model of administration, my own college, St. Stephen's, which was relatively late college because it was part of Delhi University, which was only established in the 1930s. All degrees before that were issued by Punjab University. The question is, this fertile, relatively rich uh, agrarian economy, this deeply assimilated culture of Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs, how did it, how quickly and how suddenly did it turn to be the scene of such massive bloodshed and manslaughter? How? Why? I might add, by the way, that uh, for uh, almost 50 years, or a little more than 50 years, Delhi was in fact part of Punjab. From 1858 to 1911, Delhi was administered by the British as part of the province of Punjab. So it was Kashmir at the time. Um, now, my study in this book uh, is of a large period, long period. It starts with 1707, the death of Aurangzeb. So for 90 plus years uh, of the 18th century, there is a great deal of anarchy in Punjab. There are the invasions of Nadir Shah, then of Ahmad Shah Abdali, uh, destructive invasions, and many by Abdali, and, and a very devastating one by Nadir Shah in 1739. So that's the first period I deal with, the 18th century, unstable, anarchic. And then there are 50 years where the Sikhs are ruling. Ranjit Singh rules for much of this period, and then he has his successors. And then the British come and rule for 98 years, until 1947. These are the three periods I cover. And you ask the question of why this wonderfully administered province, and yes, it is true. And uh, maybe I will have a chance a little bit later to read a, a bit about the district administration of Punjab under the British. And even before that, during Ranjit Singh's time, a good deal of stability was brought into Punjab. Um, the agriculture was prosperous. The British also uh, erected this incredible network of canals in many parts of Punjab. There was the education. Um, there was the judicial system, the railways, the post offices. Punjab was the pride of British India. And the British recruited their soldiers in World War I and also in World War II. So the administration of Punjab and the fact that the British were able to get so many soldiers from Punjab uh, gave the empire enormous pride. Um, and then it's also the fact that the nationalist movement was in some ways least popular in Punjab. Punjab was the most pro-empire part of the subcontinent. And then as the movement proceeds of independence, 
and the British response to it is of the kind that it was, uh, we have this situation where the British and the Hindus form some kind of understanding of each other in Punjab. The British and the Sikhs form some kind of understanding in Punjab. The large Muslim majority of Punjab and the British form some kind of relationship, or at least the leadership of these three groups form an understanding or a relationship with the British. But the Muslims and the Sikhs and the Hindus of Punjab don't form a relationship with one another. Uh, this is, you might say, their fault. It is the fault of their leaders. We might say it is the fault of the people themselves. But the British also played a considerable part in preventing any kind of bonding between the great communities of Punjab. And in no field was this more evident than in their military policy and the recruitment of the soldiers. The regiments that were chosen or that were created were communal regiments. And it was clear, clearly directed British policy from London and from first Calcutta and then New Delhi, Delhi that the regiments should be such that in case of any disturbance, each regiment should be willing to fire into the next regiment. This was clearly mandated policy. The regiments should be willing to shoot at the next regiment. So have a particular kind of Muslim regiment, a particular kind of Sikh regiment, a Hindu Jat regiment, a Hindu Dogra regiment. At brother soldiers. Brother soldiers. And they all salute the the Union Jack, uh, they go to uh, Europe to fight World War I, again World War II, but they're not allowed to have any kind of relationship with each other. When the killings occurred in 1947, we are accustomed to thinking of, of these killings as great eruptions, and suddenly tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands are killed in all parts of Punjab. What research has disclosed in recent years is that many of the killings were directed by demobilized soldiers of the army. In some cases, directed by demobilized soldiers of the Indian National Army, Muslim, Sikh, and Hindu who came into Punjab. It is worth noting that the organization, the direction, uh, implementation of the killings was often, often done in many parts of Punjab by demobilized soldiers. And so this is one of the great ironies of, uh, of imperial history, that the most pro-empire part of India saw the greatest violence. And the great pride of the empire in, re in creating this large army of Indian soldiers, that large army played such a crucial part in the terrible killings that, that took place. Now, I have not given a complete answer to your question of why Punjab, which had such great potential, saw this devastation. But these are some aspects, and maybe some more may come as we, as we talk further. Uh, sure. Professor Gandhi's extraordinary work, a reassessment, is of course uh, a modern post-colonial history of what great amount of original research with a uh, uh, look at British papers, papers in Pakistan, in Indian libraries, uh, interviews and so on, at what really happened to this extraordinary part of India. But it's also a story full of drama, color, spectacle. He is, after all, also, as a historian, a gifted storyteller. And among the many, many extraordinary stories told here is one of my favorites, and I know you will enjoy it. I'm going to request him to read it, is the story of the Kohinoor Diamond, which plays a key moment in the history of Punjab, now the centerpiece of the British crown jewels. But in a way, this lustrous gem tells us about the power struggles of Punjab. Will you tell us or read about it? 
Okay. Professor Gandhi. So uh, before I read uh, just a short paragraph, I'll just remind the audience here that Kohinoor was, of course, with the uh, Mughal emperors, and then Nadir Shah captured it and took it to uh, Afghanistan. And the Afghan contingent, contingents of his army uh, kept the Kohinoor, and it came into the possession of Ahmad Shah Abdali, who then also invaded India. Ranjit Singh took the Kohinoor from the successors of Ahmad Shah Abdali, so it was in Ranjit Singh's custody. And then his successors had the Kohinoor. In 1846 and in 1849, in two great wars, the British defeated the Sikh Kingdom. Uh, here in the southern part of India, uh, Tipu Sultan gave a very tough fight to the British. But other than that, or perhaps even more than that, the toughest fight given to the British in the whole subcontinent was by the Sikhs. And in one of these wars, the British actually almost lost. They won. Along with conquering all of Punjab, they also had the Kohinoor. So I'll tell you what happened to the Kohinoor after that. Please listen, it's literally a gem of a story. Uh, in the first few years of uh, British rule in Punjab, it was ruled by something called the Punjab Board. And the Punjab Board had a few members, and one of them was a man called John Lawrence. You've heard of the Lawrence schools in different parts of the subcontinent. Uh, I think there still is a Lawrence school in the, in the Nilgiris, and there certainly is one in Sonavar, and there's one in Mari after the uh, Henry Lawrence and John Lawrence. So John Lawrence was one of the members of the board which was um, controlling and, and governing Punjab. That Punjab board, that august body, nearly lost one of its greatest prizes, the Kohinoor diamond, which had become the property following annexation of Queen Victoria. Receiving firm instructions from Dalhousie, who was the viceroy in Calcutta, for the protection of the Kohinoor, the board had decided that the jewel would be safest in the custody of member John Lawrence. John was tall and strong. John put the thing in his waistcoat pocket. When after some days Dalhousie sent word that the Queen wanted it brought to her, the board relayed the requisition to John Lawrence, who felt his pocket, did not find the thing, and said nothing. Later that day, asked about it by his master, John Lawrence's servant said that he had indeed found a glass object in Master's waistcoat and placed it in a tin box. Fortunately for the Queen, and even more for John Lawrence and the entire board, that glassy thing was still in the box. You speak of uh, the annexation or the conquest of Bengal by the British in those two decisive and bloody battles known as the Anglo-Sikh Wars in 1846 and 49, but there is a towering figure there, a man called, a soldier called John Nicholson, um, who really hands Punjab finally as, as valued a prize to his masters as the Kohinoor, Kohinoor was. Tell us John Nicholson's story. So John Nicholson was uh, a soldier by background. He was not a civil servant. He came as an army man into India. Uh, and he played a very large role in the uh, conquest of uh, Punjab by the British and the defeat of the Sikhs. And then he played an even larger role, as many of you know, in suppressing the great revolt that took place in 1857, a revolt in which uh, many Sikhs in Punjab, many Punjabi Muslims, also uh, Hindu Dogras from Punjab, uh, played a very strong part at the side of the British in defeating the revolt and recapturing Delhi. Uh, before I say a word or two more about John Nicholson, uh, let me here uh, point out uh, that the district officer of the British administration in Punjab was a crucial figure. Some soldiers were made district officers and some civilians, civil service people, 
came and also ran districts in Punjab. And the district officer of Punjab became quite legendary because the administration of Punjab was hailed throughout Britain and throughout the empire as a great model, as a great example. Uh, the DC worked not in an office or courtroom, but from the back of a horse or in a tent, which was his locomotive home during some five months in the year. He rode about redressing human wrongs or sat under an immemorial tree or beside the village well to settle a dispute. He was unafraid of floods, riots, assassins. British writers would claim that most district officers were energetic, sagacious, punctual, devoted to justice and loving students of the native character and therefore successful. Now this starry-eyed portrait was not altogether false. Through its district officers, the board did transform Punjab. However, to get closer to the complex reality, we should look at a specific district officer rather than the generic or anonymous one. And so I go into a study of John Nicholson. Now, John Nicholson was a very powerful, successful soldier, and he was loved by his British comrades. In 1947, when India became independent, and a British general wrote some kind of story about the end of the British uh, Raj in India, uh, he began by paying his highest tribute to John Nicholson. But John Nicholson had another side to him, and this is not a, an attractive side, and I want to, to read uh, a bit about that here. I mentioned that John Nicholson played a large part in taking British, Sikh, and Muslim troops into Delhi to suppress the revolt. Along the way, as he went from Rawalpindi and Lahore, uh, towards Delhi, he also dealt with small revolts that were taking place in different parts of Punjab. And here is an incident that happened in Jalandhar. Nicholson arrives there, and a party is given in Jalandhar by the British Commissioner of the Jalandhar Division of Punjab. His name is Edward Lake. And Nicholson is invited to this party. Prominent among Lake's Indian guests was the strongly pro-British Mehtab Singh, a former Sikh general who was also a close relative of the Raja of Kapurthala. Noticing that like all the British present, Mehtab Singh had kept his shoes on during the reception, Nicholson decided to show off his power. After most Indian guests, including members of Mehtab Singh's entourage, had stepped out of the front door, and the Sikh dignitary's turn to leave arrived, Nicholson rasped out an order to him in Hindustani. By the way, Nicholson spoke Hindustani, Punjabi, and Pashto. So he shouts out this order to Mehtab Singh, general, a relative of Maharaja. Take your shoes off and hold them in your hands as you leave. Adding, I want your followers to see your humiliation. Nicholson declared, if I am the last Englishman left in Jalandhar, you are not to come into my room with your shoes on. Mehtab Singh had come to Lake's house, not to Nicholson's room. All the same, Nicholson's biographer informs us, quote, Mehtab Singh completely cowed, meekly did as he was told. All swaggering about in the Jalandhar area apparently ended after this demonstration by Nicholson of British dominance over Indians and his own dominance over everyone around him. Now this is what I have obtained from the biography of Nicholson, an admiring biography by a man called Lionel Trotter, which had edition after edition after edition. And Trotter quotes this as a wonderful example of how Nicholson ruled over Punjab. As you can see from these two passages Professor Gandhi's read out, this is not arid, dry, academic, boring history. It has fantastic research and he tells it through incidents and towering personalities and anecdote which really bring the history of Punjab alive. But sir, I'd like to come back to the division of Punjab. We talked about it as the most traumatic uh, event 
hundreds and thousands murdered and raped and made homeless, more than a million, million and a half. We still don't know the figures from both sides uh, of that uh, frontier. Uh, you also give us new material on how this division took place. According to you, there was quite a sane and experienced governor at that moment, Evan Jenkins. Uh, there were four judges appointed under Cyril Radcliffe, uh, the lawyers sent by the British to just draw a line on a map. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Radcliffe never visited Punjab. Uh, so never visited India. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And uh, he came later, but not at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so all the paperwork was done long distance between London and Delhi. Why then the horror, the trauma, the death toll that was unleashed? You know, the very broad context of the trauma is something like this. From the very beginning, from the time that Islam came to Punjab and to northern India and to India, there was this great ideological clash. On the Muslim side, there was this belief that ours is a superior religion. It is the perfect religion. God has revealed it to the Prophet. These Hindus of India uh, have they worship idols, they are polytheistic, they worship stones and metals, wood. Ours is a superior religion. From the Hindu side, there was this notion not of purity of belief, but of purity of birth. We are born better. We are born superior. So, purity of belief clashes with purity of birth. And yes, just as many Muslims thought of many Hindus as believers in an inferior religion, many Hindus thought of Muslims as impure because they were born abroad. They were mlechas. They were like the untouchables. So that is the background. The elites clashed like this. And then, in the 18th century, there were these invasions by Nadir Shah, by Ahmad Shah Abdali, and there were conflicts between various groups in Punjab as the Mughal Empire retreated. And the Sikh Kingdom came, and Ranjit Singh had several leading Muslims in his government. Nonetheless, it's also true that the great Badshahi Mosque, which Aurangzeb had built in Lahore, was used to store arms and ammunition. It was not allowed to be used as a place of worship. And throughout his kingdom, although there were mosques and Muslims were able to worship in them, the azan, the call to prayer, could not be pronounced. They could not pronounce the call to prayer. So there was this tension. Uh, but we must not judge Ranjit Singh's kingdom from our time Considering the circumstances in which he s captured power over all of Punjab and extended his dominion into Kashmir, into parts of Afghanistan, Peshawar, and so forth, uh, and the kind of, despite the restrictions that I have mentioned, of course, uh, the, the uh, slaughter of cattle was also banned, although it could not be enforced in areas which were almost overwhelmingly Muslim populated. Despite these restrictions, there was a fair amount of opportunity for Muslims to practice their religion. But there was tension as well. It was not a simple black or white picture. And the independence movement, one great weakness of the Congress movement in Punjab was the Congress remained largely a Hindu party, and secondly, it remained largely an urban party. It did not have enough strength in the countryside of Punjab. One party that gained a lot of prominence and influence in Punjab was the Unionist Party, which the British had encouraged. It was a pro-empire party. It was a pro-landlord party. It was a pro-feudal party. It had many 
negatives to it, but it had one wonderful positive to it. It was a party to which Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs belonged. It was secular. It was party for all. The Unionist Party, pro-empire party, but it was a party of Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs. Now, the Indian National Congress in Punjab was certainly fighting the Muslim League, which at some point said, we want Pakistan. It became quite a communal party, the Muslim League party in Punjab. Congress is fighting the Muslim League, but Congress is simultaneously fighting the Unionist Party. It's fighting, of course, the empire. So a historian could say, of course, you can't recreate the facts of the past, but a historian could ask the question, was it impossible for the Congress to find some way of reaching an understanding with the Unionists, even though they were feudal, even though they were pro-empire, but at least they were against partition. They were against dividing Punjab or India as a whole in a religious way. But the left wing of the Congress, the progressive wing of the Congress, was totally against any negotiation with the Unionists. And the Punjabi leaders of the Congress within Punjab, who were mostly Hindus, were also against any understanding with the Unionists in Punjab. So that was, uh, you might say, one of the causes for the continuing distrust that created the climate in which eventually the killings came. But perhaps the most significant point uh, which emerges in my research is the failure of the local or Punjab level leadership, whether in the Muslim League or in the Sikh parties or in the Congress party or in the other Hindu parties of Punjab. The local leaders could not find ways of finding some acceptable compromise in Punjab. And this was above all illustrated in the case of the Radcliffe Commission. By this time, the Congress, the Muslim League, the Sikh parties, and the British had agreed that yes, there will be a partition of Bengal, there would be a partition of Punjab, but where exactly should the line be drawn? So this British jurist, Sir Cyril Radcliffe, was named the head of this commission. And he came to India. He stayed in Delhi, he did not visit Punjab. And he gave his award in the end. But he was supported by four other ju Indian judges. There were five judges in the commission. Radcliffe was the chair. There were two Muslim judges who had been nominated by the Muslim League, and two non-Muslim judges, one a Sikh judge and one a Hindu judge, nominate, nominated by the Indian National Congress and the Akali Party. But that kind of attempt by the Punjabi's leaders never took place, which in this historian's assessment played a very significant part in the tragedy that unfolded. And if I may continue with your permission, Sunil. You know, today we have the Telangana and the Simandra question. There are very strong passions on both sides. And Delhi is asked to intervene. And various political parties, other than the government, are also asked to intervene or they intervene. If Delhi proposes a solution that the Telangana side may favor, the other side naturally gets furious and the other way around. No, no proposal that Delhi will create without the total agreement of influential people on both sides of the divide in Andhra will work. It's so obvious. So if we are to learn a lesson from the tragedy of Punjab, it is this. The Telangana leaders and the Simandra leaders have to say, let us, for the time being, forget Delhi. Let us sit together and see. We all have very powerful uh, emotions. We have strong reasons. But is it not possible for us to sit together and see how we can work out what the future should be? That really is the purpose, in my opinion. In my opinion, that's the purpose of a great historian, uh, to probe questions whether the past holds lessons for the present, indeed our future. The simple point you've made is that through all the negotiations in New Delhi, in London, in Lahore, uh, in Sevagram, 
nobody really bothered to consult the people of Punjab, the local leadership, or to ask them that did they want this division, and if so, how? My point further is, or my question rather, Professor Gandhi, is that we talk of division of lands, of a changed uh, geography, uh, which creates terrible distortions in society, in history. We don't know how the rivers, the la where the rivers of the land of five rivers flow now. We don't know which rivers are in Pakistan, how many are in India. People mistake the old Mughal route to Srinagar. But through all this, something more dreadful seems to have occurred. And that is the division of what you call a culture, Punjabiyat. The same language, the same songs, the same huge cultural tradition of poetry, of literature, from Warisha and Bulesha to Sadat Hasan Manto to great painters like Amrita Shergil. Let's not forget she was a Lahore girl and died there at the age of 26. Uh, these great stars and heroes and writers that have created the film industry. How did Punjabi, the language that had unified this culture, how was that appropriated or expropriated by the two countries? Well, is this is the same a language. Very, very important question, Sunil. Uh, and here, let us remember, you know, in many parts of the world, including in Indian Punjab, there is the notion that Punjabi is the language of the Sikhs. A great many Hindus also speak Punjabi. And as I mentioned, a great many Muslims speak Punjabi. Many more Muslims in the world speak Punjabi than Sikhs speak Punjabi because of the population of uh, Muslim Punjab, of Pakistani Punjab. Uh, you know, one of the great secrets of the success of the Sikh religion was that it was conveyed, implemented, discussed in the Punjabi language. And drew deeply on a secular Sufi tradition. It, di it did indeed. But I was going to say that centuries before great Guru Nanak, uh, Baba Farid and other Sufi leaders that you have mentioned also wrote poetry in Punjabi. Punjabi, or, or, or a variant of it, or a dialect of it, but it was essentially a Punjabi language that was used by the Sufis as they spoke, as they sang, and Guru Nanak and his later gurus. So the Punjabi language, in some way, it did not completely solve this clash that I have spoken of between purity of faith and purity of birth, but it did help to create a wonderful Coexistence, some kind of ability to live together at the grassroots. People traded with each other, people were dependent on each other. Um, and of course, uh, there was the poetry. Um, it's incredible the number of people today in Pakistani Punjab who will quote from Bulle Shah, Waris Shah from the 18th century. In everyday conversation, they speak. Just as we quote from Fez Ahmed Fez or yes, Iqbal yes. or the great poets. And likewise in, in, in Indian Punjab. So Punjabi, the Punjabi language was in some way uh, both a reason for as well as an expression of Punjabiyat, the commonness between all the Punjabis. There were these tensions that I've spoken of. There was also this coexistence at grassroots level. But today, a great many people of the younger generation in Pakistani Punjab have no idea that there was once this partnership or relationship with Indian Punjab or with India or with Sikhs or with Hindus. And similarly, a great many people in Indian Punjab or today's Haryana, today's Himachal, all were part of, of this undivided Punjab, have no idea that their fathers and grandparents lived in a kind of relationship with what is now Pakistani Punjab. And of course, we have had wars, we have had terrorism, we have extremism, and it continues to come from Pakistani Punjab. And by the way, it kills many people in Pakistani Punjab. Terrorism emanating from 
Pakistan affects India very seriously, but it affects the people of Pakistan even more seriously. It kills Indians, but it kills many times more Pakistanis, which is something that we also have to appreciate. Now, um, it is one thing to say or to recognize that Indian Punjab is completely ignorant of, has, has shut its mind towards its earlier relationship. Pakistani Punjab has shut its mind towards the earlier relationship, but merely because we shut our minds does, does not mean that realities don't exist. The Punjabis live across the border. There was once a relationship. The people are still there. The language is still there. The trade is still possible. The poetry is still sung. Songs are still sung. And so, so there is this painful reality that we are completely unaware of these deep links, not so ancient links, these recent links, these precious links. They have enriched our culture. They are so important a part of our life. Now here I am, I'm half Tamil, I'm half Gujarati. By some great good fortune, I have become involved with the people of Punjab, the rivers of Punjab, the districts of Punjab, the towns of Punjab, the villages of Punjab, hundreds of characters of Punjab. If I, in some ways a complete outsider, can feel this, this commonness, this bond between Punjabi from Atak and the Punjabi from Ambala, Surely, millions and millions of Punjabis, like Gulzar Sahib today. Now, Gulzar Sahib does not appeal to one religious group. He appeals to everybody. And the same is true of so many others. So it is to remind people, how many will read this book, how many will absorb it, whatever facts it may have or may not have, is, I, I, I don't know. But certainly it is my, my longing, my prayer, that some people will read this. Some people will be reminded of that old connection and the value of that connection and what that connection may yet do, uh, perhaps to avert future tragedies, perhaps to restore some kind of relationship. You know, the... One, one part of the, this book, which I, I, I will not take time on, on, on it this evening, my wife and I did more than two dozen interviews with survivors of 47 on both sides of the border, not only to discover the terrible things that happened, but also to discover how Hindus and Sikhs saved many Muslim lives in 47, and how many Muslims saved Hindu and Sikh lives in 47. It is true that when that poisonous wind swept across Punjab, touched down in different parts of Punjab, and several people were killed, many Punjabis killed each other, but many more Punjabis saved Punjabi lives. This is the, this is the underreported story of 47. And, uh, uh, in my assessment, an important chapter in this book contains these interviews from survivors who recall with names, places, and dates how the other side helped their side to survive and to escape. And perhaps that's also the purpose of as visionary and painstaking a historian as Rajmohan Gandhi to remind us that political divisions, divisions of a state, a land, can have the most nightmarish consequences for subsequent generations. They can tear away at a fairly assimilated social system, a language, a culture. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll just take two questions for Professor Gandhi, as we completely run out of time, can, can we pass a mic? Uh, the others won't hear you. 
It's coming in a minute. I'm sorry, we can't take more than two questions. That is the main drawback in the Indian politics. We cannot bring out each and every party's ideology in the same line. That is the thing, though your uh, 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 point of view is correct, maybe. Two points I asked about the Indian National Congress, which was led by Motilal Nehru, the first pre president of INC, was not appreciated uh, the division. And Telangana. Uh, you know, uh, Motilal Nehru was not the first president of the Indian National Congress at all. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, madam, that is, that is not the case. Motilal Nehru was a very influential leader of the Indian National Congress. He was often president. Uh, once or twice he was president. He certainly was not the first president. Uh, on Telangana, you say that different ideologies, different parties have to come together. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I accept that. Next question, one more. Professor, Professor Ga Gandhi, you have said that Punjab was the least nationalistic and, uh, well, in the early uh, part of the previous century, there was an advertisement from Lahore, want martyrs, their salary is death, their uh, uh, reward is martyrdom. Their pension is freedom. The field of action is Hindustan. This was put out by Pacific Coast Hindi Association, which was later renamed as Gadar Party by Sohan Singh. And if only we think that the entire nationalist movement to belong to the National Congress, then only what you said can be true. Thank you, sir, for a very important question. Yes, the Gadda Party was a very important force in 1911, 12, 13, 14, 15 in Punjab. Uh, a little later, there was the Bhagat Singh uh, uh, movement also, which was very influential in, in Lahore and elsewhere in Punjab. But, you know, these very courageous, very daring, very bold nationalists did not necessarily transform the thinking of the whole of Punjab. Neither was the Indian National Congress able to do so. I'm not saying that there were not very patriotic, nationalistic figures ready to embrace death in Punjab. There were many such heroic people. But by and large, the support for the empire was greater in Punjab than in other parts of India. And many people, nothing to do with the Indian National Congress, but many people at the time referred to Punjab as the Ulster of India, also, as, as you remember. But thank you for reminding everyone of the role of the Gada Party. I, I appreciate that. Professor Gandhi, I want to thank you very much for this enlightening and brilliant session on your book. Would you please give Professor Gandhi a very big hand? Professor Gandhi will be signing his book at the counter here. I'm sorry we had very limited time for questions. Please direct further questions to him while you buy his book, get it autographed, and he'll be delighted to engage with you. He's not going anywhere. Thank you.